I'm I'm on the way to the house, not even knowing if I'm gonna get drafted. <laughs> what my agent's talking about, he's giving me the whole plan about each team and at each pick, and you know who's interested in not. All right, welcome back to the Role Player Podcast, presented by Swish Cultures, featured on Eurohoops.net, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. Of course, we back again. We got. I am Jordan Taylor, and we back again with 11-year overseas vet, CEO, co-founder, and Stanford gentleman, Anthony Goods. What's good with you? How you feeling? What you man, got for uh, me today, uh, man? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you looking, you looking like a substitute teacher right now with that background <laughs> and the jogger. <laughs> you're, like a, you're like a substitute teacher on Friday, but listen, you know, it's listen. cool. Listen, 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 listen. I'm still a cold nigga, though. That's the thing. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, been, it's been a long weekend and a ride engagement parties this weekend. It's Monday morning, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just trying to get right. I had to brush my hair in the car. You know how we do, because I knew you was, I know you probably came from some some date trying to look pretty last night. So I was trying to match your energy. You know what I'm saying? But uh, don't, don't kill yourself trying to be like me, man. Stay, stay in your lane, man. Stay in the, be from Wisconsin, man. <laughs> Never, my bad, never. my bad, my bad. Minnesota, Minnesota, Minnesota's be, in the building. Y'all think today, man. Let, let, me we, we, let me be on my best behavior. Let me be on my best behavior, man. Yeah. Let me be on my best behavior, man. Yeah, you brought that, the enforcer that, now. You brought security. You brought that, Minnesota security. You know what I mean? That pack. I can wrestle. That, I can wrestle with you. I ain't wrestling with Roddy though, man. Yeah, I ain't man. wrestling with Roddy, man. I don't want hey, no that, smoke. <laughs> that Pac-12 allegiance you thought you had with Kelsey, we really got in full effect because we got Minnesota's own. Minneapolis's own Golden Valley. I think Golden Valley. He go. He gonna tell us here in a second exactly where from. But we got the Mountain West Player of the Year, two-time First Team All Mountain West Player, and an AP Honorable Mention All American. I should just drop the Honorable Mention because you should have been All American just straight up. And then the twenty-third pick in this year's draft to the uh, Philadelphia 76ers and now traded to the Memphis Grizzlies. We got. Minneapolis's own David Roddy. What's good, Roddy? We appreciate you coming on, joining us. Appreciate y'all for having me, man. Hey, now listen. This dude been talking crazy. Been talking crazy, crazy for about for about three months. He always want to say I'm from Wisconsin. He just, you know, he from Cali, from the suburbs of Cali, like okay. me. But you know, he he try. He okay. think he's from LA for real. So I've been trying to tell this man he need to put some respect on Minnesota's name for a long time. So I'm glad you're here because you putting respect on Minnesota for us, man. Just tell us about start. First of all, congratulations. That's that's Thank amazing. You, Appreciate congratulations. it. Congratulations. I know you yes, on sir. cloud nine right now. So for you even to take the time and join us in this, you know, busy time, we, we definitely appreciate that. Um, but start off, man, walk us through the process because you were the you were really the surprise of the first round. You know, you obviously had a lot of buzz. You know, me and Anthony had the same agent. I was going back and forth with my agent, like, nah, Roddy's going, Roddy's going early, second, yada, yada, yada. He was like, we'll see, we'll see. And then to go, he texted me because I was at practice. He's like, Roddy went 23rd. And I was like, I told you. Yo, so so yeah. walk us through your, your emotional uh, mindset right now, or your emotional place and your mindset just going 23rd when you're supposed to go, you know, lower. Yeah, um, man, it's a it's a surreal experience. Um, you know, I had my draft party at, at one of my coaches' house, and they – you know, I'm super thankful for them to, you know, share their house for that, you know, dream. Um, yeah, you know, I, I started really just taking pictures. I started out taking pictures with family and stuff, getting that all over with. And my initial plan was like to sit down at like pick 28, um, you know, because that's, I think, where, you know, my hot spot was a little bit. Um, and then some just forced me to sit down at 19. And so, um, you know, sit down with my family and you know, just wondering, you know, when I'm going to get drafted, what's going on. You know, I've, I'm, I'm on the way to the house, not even knowing if I'm going to get drafted. <laughs> what my agent's talking about, he's giving me the whole plan about each team and at each pick and, you know, who's interested in that. And so, um, yeah, bro, it was just a surreal experience. You know, my agent was, you know, walking back and forth pretty calmly throughout the night, you know, just updating my mom about, you know, what's going on. And then by pick 21, he started walking faster, like moving fast and like had both phones out, like trying to call it, call the agent and everything. And, uh, and then after that video or the video that, you know, is on Twitter now by CSU, that's the phone call with my agent just, you know, telling me that I'm about to get picked in the next, the next pit by the Grizzlies. And, uh, 
man, just that moment was just so surreal. I didn't even want to believe him. Um, you know, my fam- family freaked out and, and, uh, you know, it was just a whole, a whole weight just lifted off my shoulders. You know what I'm saying? It's just a childhood dream that, you know, it's very rare for people to achieve. Uh, and I'm super blessed and, and honored to be, you know, again, a part of the, you know, the NBA and being drafted and everything. And, um, you know, God works in mysterious ways, man. I didn't, I had no idea, no idea that Memphis was going to, you know, select me that high. Um, I knew they were interested, but again, they tried to keep it close to the vest. And so they didn't want to express their interest that, that early in the process. So, man, I've just been on cloud nine the entire time. I've been in workouts and, you know, working out with Chauncey and, and, you know, back home and it just doesn't even feel real. I had my jersey on. It just doesn't even, I promise you, it doesn't even feel real yet. (laughs) That's crazy. What a... So like after that, after you get drafted, did you did you watch the rest of the draft or you was just like, all right, it's done, let's get the party going? <laughs> nah, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't I was just on cloud nine. I walked outside. I mean, I talked with, with Zach and Taylor, um, you know, the GM and the head coach, and then uh, you know, Desmond called me after that and I just got, you know, text messages from from all the players just saying what's up and congratulations. Uh, you know, congratulations, lots of hugs, lots of pictures after that and um, yeah, no, nah, I couldn't. I couldn't even watch the draft after that. Man, you had a. Did you did you have any type of uh, agreements, like any spots in the draft where you knew you were gonna go? Like if if uh, Memphis didn't come for just to, quick background for those that aren't familiar. You know, some players get promises at certain picks, whatever. So, did you have any anything like that in place? Yeah, I didn't have a solidified promise. I would say. I mean, a lot of teams were interested. Um, you know, later in the draft, um, I know, you know, Boston was very high on me the entire time. Um, you know, they had pick 53. Um, you know, they ex- just explained their situation with that contract. I mean, um, you know, they did they did have high interest in me uh, and they would see, you know, hey, if he's still there, uh, which I don't think he will be, you know, we'll, you know, we'll get him and everything. But, you know, there's just certain talks like that, that, you know, is a good kind of floor i would say for the draft um but you know other than that really no other team was kind of like oh we're gonna promise him this we're gonna promise him that so um yeah no i didn't get too many promises yeah it seemed like around the 20s in the draft it seemed like everything was just going crazy in regards to like trades and movements and you know just uh just rumors and things like that um yeah man like were, were you hearing you know, was there another spot that you thought like, okay, maybe I, I could have gone before, you know, obviously you found out that you were going to go 23. Yeah. Um, for us, I think it was, uh, it was golden state. So right before I sat down, my mom was telling me like, Hey, golden state's trying to trade up to get you. Um, you know, there's some other teams as well. Some other teams, you know, especially on draft night, sometimes they'll just throw something out and then, you know, see what other teams are thinking or, you know, certain trades and stuff. So, um, you know, it was definitely, I think it was Golden State that was trying to trade up. Uh, I think Washington, D.C. as well, the Wizards. Um, And so, yeah, I think those two were the last ones I heard about, you know, prior to the draft and during the draft. Um, But, you know, Memphis decided, you know, to get me super early and they they was their plan all along. So, um, so yeah, I'm just blessed to finally be a part of a great organization i'm a i'm gonna be honest I, I don't know what y'all think but i think that to have i guess to have golden state and memphis now too because memphis track record in the draft is you know increasingly maybe i mean honestly I, I can't say it's better than golden state yet but you know it's it's been amazing so to have those two type of organizations be you know have you on their list like that to me is a kind of an ultimate stamp as a player and maybe you know the possibilities that you're able to bring um, bring to the table so does that make you feel does that give you a sense of confidence, you know, having those type of organizations, no disrespect to anybody like, you know, I don't know, the, the Sacramento Kings or nothing like that. But it's like, does no, that you, give you You definitely a, disrespecting them. You didn't mention them. You didn't mention the Kings. There's definitely disrespect there. Hey, Let's don't don't hey, sugarcoat it. Don't sugarcoat it. Hey, you gave all the love hey, to go to State of Memphis. Hey, what, what the kids say it now, the Kings is trash, respectfully. But you know, you know what I'm saying? So does, does that give you any, any added confidence, uh, you know, going into the league, having you – know, somewhat of a stamp of approval from those type of type of teams? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Um, but again, you know, like Desmond said, told me is, you know, getting drafted is kind of a an entry fee. You know, it doesn't really matter where you get drafted. Um, 
you know, you still got to prove yourself. So, um, you know, it's, it's a good feeling for, you know, established teams to want me um, and, you know, try to trade up picks to, to, to grab me and everything and prioritize me in the draft. And, um, but again, you know, that's just a small step. You know, I did, you know, going through pre-draft, going through all these workouts and, and all the stress and worry, it's, it's all just to get to the starting line. It's not, this isn't the, this isn't the finish line and, and, you know, no sense of the word. So, um, you know, I'm just super excited just to get to work and, and just get better every day. Uh, just because I know, you know, how hard I've got work to get here. And now I need, in I know how much harder I need to work, you know, to stay. So that's the, that's the really important part, but you know, it definitely does feel good for teams to, you know, try to prioritize me. Yeah, let's talk about these these pre draft workouts. What uh, how how did it go for you? What what kind of things were did you did you feel like any teams were were specifically trying to put you in uncomfortable situations to try and find a weakness? Like what uh what things were you noticing while you were on the uh, pre draft trail? And like how many teams you work out with and all that? Man, uh, the pre draft uh, the pre draft process is is something in its own man. It's its own season, I would say. Um. I worked out for 15 teams. It was supposed to be 16, but Dallas traded their pick uh, for 26. So uh, I got an extra few days in Dallas. So I worked out with uh, with Tyler Ralph down there. But um, man, I started my pre draft process April 4th, and then you know all the way till June 20 or June 21st was my last pre draft workout with Boston. So man, it's just consistent travel. You don't even know what city you're in. You're living out of a duffel bag for two months three you know three weeks at a time sometimes um yeah it's just a, it's a crazy process because you go to you know each team you you know get dinners with the front office or whoever and uh the next morning you got to wake up super super early get your measurables tested combine testing and then you get on the court and then you're on the court for an hour hour 15 minutes you know some some workouts are easier than others i would say or less intense than others but those are the more important ones because you're so mentally locked in and it's just, you know, there's just so many things that can burn you out in the pre draft process. Um, but man, it's, it's an unforgettable process, but I would never want to go through that again. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a definitely a, a weird situation to be in, but again, you know, I'm blessed just to be, you know, a part of it and, and you know, work out for 15 teams. Man, that's that's a that's a whole other season. Like <laughs> I don't think people realize yeah. that's a that's a whole other basketball season. That's how yeah. me and good well, maybe not good no more, but that's how I'm still living in the summer though, by out of duffel bags for two months, you know, man, city yeah. to city. For whole other reasons. I got more <laughs> Cosmigos in my life, but that's <laughs> good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Still draining all the same, you know. But yo, what was uh going into your workouts? I mean, you're going city to city. Obviously, you're aware of your strengths. You're you're aware of your weaknesses and what teams are saying. So, how do you combat you know the the mental side of things with actually being able to perform? Um, is it one of those things where you know you just trust in the work, or are you super aware of what they're saying you can't do and trying to trying to improve on those things, or are you just trying to show your strengths in a way where it's like I'm so good at this that forget my weaknesses you know what i mean yeah it's a little bit of both i would say um you know octagon and and, and you know training with phil beckner and von compton they definitely prepare you for the pre-draft process i mean pretty much every pre-draft workout is you know based around the same things ball handling finishing and shooting and then you know three on three in competition after that so um you know i was definitely prepared well for just the the run through of a pre-draft workout mentality wise got to go hard every single time show them that you're in shape show them that you know you care show them that you know you go hard every single time and and that's just a part of who you are um you know the weaknesses and strengths they already know your strengths and weaknesses uh you know they know i'm a good shooter they know i'm a good passer they want to see me compete they want to see you dive on the floor they do do the little things are you willing to do the little things so um you know they definitely know your skills some even even some coaches before give you advice of like Hey, we know you can shoot. We know you can pass. You know you're a good player, but you know we want to see this. We want to see you read a closeout. We want to see you, you know, play a specific role or you know defend really well. So, um, you know, they're pretty upfront. If you ask them a question first, this is just, hey, what do you think? What do you see me doing? And you know, what can I improve on? So, um, it's not. It's it's like a test, but if you think of it as a test, then that's when you start, you know, tensing up and and not playing well. So. 
just go in there, have fun, compete, and just enjoy the moment for sure. No oh, question. Moving for so moving forward now that you're in you're in there, who who do you see yourself most in? And and I know I know a lot of y'all young cats give that answer is I'm one of one and all that, but I want to know <laughs> I want to know who you see yourself in in the league at this point. Like what type of role do you see yourself fitting? And like who's a person that you will look to? I guess to be like, okay, I I can fit in there. I can do that. Yeah. Well, I mean. You know what's what's helping me is is the case of the case of Grant Williams. Um, you know he's the most tangible, you know, figure for my physique as well as you know he's a great three and D player. Uh, knocks down open shots, knocks down corner threes as well as you know guards one through five. You know I was guard I was watching the playoffs and you know they were playing Milwaukee and he literally switched on. He was guarding Giannis and switched on Drew Holiday and then switched to Chris Middleton or, or Bobby Portis and so it's just like. That versatility is super, super important. Um, you know, people want to compare me to, you know, like a P.J. Tucker-esque as well. I think I can learn a lot from him watching his film, especially on defense and just his mentality. Um, you know, he's a great player. Draymond Green as well. You know, he can facilitate, um, you know, defend one through five as well. Uh, and so I think that mold will, will definitely get me playing time, especially in the beginning of my career. Um, and I think I can, you know, branch out and, you know, use my – you know, playmaking skills as well as, as, you know, adding more to my game. So I, you know, I'm not just pigeonholed into a single role. Yeah, I think you're, you're definitely underrated athletic, man. I think, uh, yeah. I don't think that that got, that got talked about enough, you know, throughout the, I mean, I think a lot of people did talk about the shooting and the skill and stuff like that, but I think you're, uh, you're definitely underrated, you know, athletically, you know what I'm saying? And I would probably say, out of all those guys <laughs> that you named, you know, at least, uh, especially in regards to jumping, man, I think uh, I don't think any of those guys could jump over a phone book. But, you know, uh, I, I think you definitely, man, uh, you, you bring a level of athleticism that I don't think really gets uh, gets talked about enough. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to tough to like watch it, especially with college film, because college, like, I mean, I was in just such a rhythm of knowing where my spots were and, you know, didn't really have to use my athleticism that much. I mean, I got a few dunks here and there and everything, but, um, you know, having a quick first step and a very explosive step for me with my size is very important. I think I have an explosive step, so that's where I get, you know, bigs off balance. I get, you know, small guys off balance as well. Um, but, yeah, I'm just excited to, you know, get with the strength staff and get even more explosive uh, and kind of show show that side of my game because that's that's the fun part too so um i for sure got that but um you know there's still work to be done that that's one thing that i mean answer right, i think that you are definitely underrated athletically that's one thing i hate about about the draft too and all these comparisons i don't know about y'all but like you get a certain you have a certain body type and it's like oh all right he's you know pj tucker or grant williams which i think there's some truth to that but at the same time i think that you're probably better offensively all around at least coming out of college than a lot of those dudes were you know Draymond was Draymond even jump Draymond couldn't jump over a phone I feel like to his like third third year in the league or something but he wasn't as good with the ball and making reads as he was now coming out of college and I think you kind of have an advanced uh advanced placement uh in regards to them so I mean yeah I guess I'm excited for you to to be able to show that stuff because it, it's going to be fun to watch I think you know you could probably play you know what, three through five offensively, depending on the lineup, the way the game is now. So, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, that's that's the biggest selling point of me is is you know, using CSU. I was at the at the five guard or five position like fifteen minutes of the game. So, um, you know, that was one of my favorite positions to play, especially in our offense. I mean, lots of split actions, lots of you know wide pin downs, and and you know opportunities for me to shoot the three as well as facilitate. So. You know, for me to accept that role at the five uh, my sophomore year and, and understood, like, hey, this small ball is just, you know, the five and the one are the ones who, you know, handle the ball the most and, and control the offense the most. So, you know, having, you know, myself and Isaiah Stevens, you know, be those two guys and, and you know, facilitate off of it and score off of it, man, it was just so much fun. So uh, definitely blessed to you know, be a part of that team and, and just, you know, learn learn the five and, and understand the role. You know, also, I think, you know, part of being, like, underrated athletically, some of that comes from being from Minnesota. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody thought, <laughs> nobody thought Jordan <laughs> Taylor was athletic, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Hey, who from who from Minnesota have they ever said like was athletic? Hey, I would, no lie when he said that Sucks. I was thinking like it, I was gonna say it's a Midwest thing, but especially a Minnesota a Minnesota thing for sure, no question. Yeah, and I think too, I I'll give y'all this though, I give y'all this. I don't know a dumb basketball player that's come out of Minnesota either. Nope. I feel like y'all all. Y'all kind of like, like in Southern California, y'all kind of like, like Orange County, you know what I mean? The real fundamental, you know, the, um, you know, good shooters, play the game the right way, that type of thing. And also the unathletic tag is thrown out there. But, um, yeah, like just thinking about the, the few players that I know from Minnesota, man, like everybody's real sound, you know, just all around wise, you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't even – I've been trying to say that and explain that to everybody. You know, again, I was on the pulley team my sophomore year with, you know, Trey Jones, Daniel Laturu, uh, myself, Gabe Kalsher, that, that team. We were number one in the country for most of the time. And people were, you know, always looking over and be like, hey, man, these light skins are, you know, these dudes, they, they weak, they soft, all this stuff. And we would, we would beat them by 25, 30 points every single time. Um but it was just understanding, like, bro, we, we've practiced these sets all the time. We know where everybody is. The chemistry is great. Like, it's just understanding basketball at a young age is something that I have no idea, like, where it comes from. But just, like, within the peer group, it was just, like, a foundation of, of our development, really. Um, at a young age, you know, just playing basketball the right way, being coached the right way. You know, again, all the pillars of, of coaching in the Minnesota, they all know each other. And, you know, at every AAU team, there's at least somebody or some high school, like everybody's connected. So, you know, their teachers are pretty similar as well. Um, but, yeah, I don't even know where it comes from. But I've been trying to explain this to everybody, especially even since high school. Like there's a fundamental, you know, basis of how we play basketball. And that's how we just get connected so, so fast. Yo, it, it is. We've talked about this before on here, but I think it is a regional thing, whether it comes from like the NBA level, like, you know, like I've talked about, I grew up watching Terrell Brandon and Chauncey Billups and we didn't have NBA league pass. So it's like, that's just who you model. Your, that's what you see most. All right? You see AI and Kobe, but it's like, you just still don't get to see them as much. But yeah, definitely with Pulley Team, y'all y'all do got the whole supersonic uh, Anderson pack, Lenny Kravitz, y'all, y'all, it's a bunch of clones over there. The light skin effect is real out here, man. <laughs> As I said, all, 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 all the dudes went, went interracial, got them some light skin athletic babies, man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, no, but uh, yeah. it's definitely even even like like you said, like Jalen Suggs is athletic. He's probably the most athletic cat to come out of Minnesota. Yeah. But I would say his game, I, I don't think he plays like an athletic game, if that makes sense. He's still sound. He's still very, you know, basic, which – Nowadays, I think it's kind of undervalued because um, at the end of the day, basic to me, basic is what's going to get you paid. You take Steph Curry, you take James, Hall, like whoever. They're obviously so advanced with the get with the ball in the game now, but I think first and foremost, like they mastered the fundamentals to a level um, where you know a lot of other people have not. So, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, that's the one thing I've learned over this pre jab process, especially. You know, with certain trainers, um, you know, Phil Beckner and, and Von Compton and Octagon were, you know, so enveloped in the fundamentals and the details. Um, becoming more detail oriented, you know, as a pro is something that was the biggest jump for me, I would say. Um, you know, from college, it was it was a really high level of, of detail uh, with, with Coach Ali Farouk Manesh and, and that developmental team. But, you know. At a, at a, as a pro it's different there's like there's no there's no gray area it's like all right is that a good rep or not a good rep there's no like oh this was kind of a good rep no you have to go do it again so uh they definitely helped me push and understand that like this detail oriented like it's a job you need to become a an expert at everything so um yeah no nah, it's it's definitely it's definitely different yeah it's funny man i remember uh when I was when I was at Stanford, we went to uh, we went to Italy in the summer, and uh, we were playing against some of the pro teams there. And it was uh, I remember we were playing against a uh, Taekwon Dean. And I remember watching him in college and all that other stuff. And I remember we were at the free throw line, and uh, I was just asking, I was like, "Yo, man, so how you like playing over here?" 
And he just looked at me. He's like, it's a job. <laughs> I was like, all right. I ain't know how to take it. And then it's like once I got overseas and I started hooping, I was like, I understood everything he meant by not saying a lot. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, there's going to be good parts to it. There's going to be, you know, some some not so good parts. But, you know, at the end of the day, you really do, as much as we love the game, you do have to look at it like a job in, in a lot of different uh, in a lot of different ways. But um, but one thing I wanted to ask going back to the draft now that, you know, we're we're officially like probably about four days out since the draft. What ha- what have the first few days been like? Like, what have you been doing? What was the night or the morning, the next morning? Like, how did everything go down? Man, I couldn't even tell you. Uh, just I'm on cloud nine still. It still doesn't even feel real. Um, you know, at, right after the draft, uh, we were kind of debating because I was just so exhausted. My adrenaline was going down and um, you know, they were like, oh, we got to go out. And I am I usually don't go out. I never, it's very rare for me to like go out or, you know, go out to a bar or anything like that. So uh, even when my mom was like, yeah, you need to go out. Like you need to celebrate this moment. Uh, I was like, all right, I'm going I'm to tag along and everything. So we, we went around downtown Minneapolis a little bit and um, it were not, was not out there long. I mean, it was just pretty much too late for everyone. You know, everyone probably left already. I saw Jordan um you know at the loop downtown so um you know what i'm saying just chilling caught me off guard i was like my guy <laughs> he's a hey chill chill no, uh, with you. undisclosed location um you know what i'm saying so uh you know again just celebrating with my family and and going out and celebrating that moment was was huge for me uh did not get sleep at all like three hours maybe and then the next day i had to fly out to memphis um you know, do all the PR stuff. So podcasts, radio shows, um, you know, the press release as well, uh, or the press conference as well as, uh, you know, put on my Jersey and stuff. Uh, that didn't feel real. It was just so fast. It was just like, all right, well, the next day you're a Memphis Grizzly. So, um, let's take photos. And then, you know, we had a dinner with everybody in the front office and, and the coaching staff as well with all the draft picks and their families. Um, and then, you know, chilled at, at Dez's house. And then, uh, you know, flew back to Minneapolis. So I got a few days rest here, uh, work out and get ready for, for camp for summer league. So it's, it's just going by so fast and, um, it's still surreal. I don't think I'll ever escape this feeling of, you know, achieving the dream and, and just enjoying the moment as much as possible. Hey, I saw, I saw this man walk. I'm in the loop, you know, doing my usual thing. I had a, I had a high noon and a tequila shot over there with my guy (laughs) and he walked in and we was like, yo, that's that's Roddy. And, you know, this is, what, this is an hour after the draft. So, you know, and obviously with, in Minnesota, Chet, it was the biggest name. Everybody looking for Chet and yada, yada, yada. So that might be the last time I think you'll ever be able to slide through the crowd in the loop like that in your lifetime yeah. moving forward. And I was yeah. like, oh, so I got to go over there, you know. And I, I felt just so happy for you. I took it. He don't drink. So I took a tequila shot for this man. Like, I was trying to get him one. He was like, nah, I don't drink. I was like, I got you. But I guess – Again, to kind of reiterate, or I guess go back a little bit, going from where you were supposed to go to the to the first round, that's got to change your mindset up a little bit because I guess you're still, amongst your draft class in Memphis, like expectations are going to fall upon you now that might not have come, you know, being drafted later. Um, you know, it's great to say, you know, it's, it's the entry point and you got the right mindset and all that. But that emotional... The emotions had to change because it goes from, you know, a non potentially non guaranteed contract to a guaranteed contract. You know, you're probably going to be expected to give minutes right away to a team that was in the second round of the playoffs and really had championship aspirations. So just how are you going to manage that grind? And then second question would be, how do you see yourself fitting in day one uh, from a role standpoint with Jai and Bain and all those dudes? Yeah, uh, I feel like my mindset you know, we'll just be even more intense, I would say. Um, you know, I still think I always have that underdog mentality, yeah. um, you know, being underappreciated my entire basketball career, really, um, until late, as of late. Um, you know, I still have that mindset. You know, I still have that chip on my shoulder, and I have something to prove every single day. Um, and I think that's something that is great about, you know, Memphis and, and my role within this organization. Um, you know, a bunch of underdogs, a bunch of young talent, a bunch of people who, you know, 
are super super competitive and love to win and hate to lose uh, i think i'll fit right in in that in that sense um you know just bring my physicality to the floor uh, my versatility you know i think that's something that is needed from playoff teams um, you know, you see a bunch of teams who are successful have a, have a PJ Tucker, have a, a Grant Williams, a Draymond Green type. So um, if I can fit that role and, and be you know as physical as possible while you know guarding you know pretty much one through five, hopefully. So um, you know I can definitely get more minutes on the on the you know in the big games. So I'm just super excited to just, just get to work, man, and just compete every day and um, you know just carve out a role for myself and and just trust myself with this, within this process. Yo, you you and Bane are probably the two buffest shooters in the league now. <laughs> <laughs> both of y'all need to just stay oh, away from real? the weight room. <laughs> like, yeah, both of y'all look like y'all be eating weights. Like, <laughs> nah, yeah, bro, it's bro. We yeah, for sure. Like switching, like if if they got to switch on from Bane to me, it just be like, bro, like just straight physical the whole time. So, nah, yeah, yeah, nah. We we both some football players for sure. I'm a, that motherfucker's the Bash Brothers in Memphis, man. We out there, <laughs> be out there decking people, yo. <laughs> bring some of that oh old physicality, <laughs> right? Hey, but the I Jordan know, rules. I know Roddy bring the Jordan be, rules back. Hey, bring the Jordan rules back, man. Yep. Bring them back, yo. I know Roddy gonna be good because he really got a. I, I could tell he got a little bit of a don't give a fuck mindset. We was walking out when leaving. And I was like, hey, man, he introduced me to his team. Isaiah, right, Stevens, is that yeah. he introduced me to? Yeah. And I was walking out. You know, I'm a little tissy, and I'm like, hey, man, I'm talking, I'm excited for you, but you lost me money against Michigan. He's like, I don't give a fuck. I was like, damn, <laughs> you don't give a damn about my money at all. <laughs> I'm like, oh, like, man. <laughs> bro, you know how many times I heard that, bro? Like, what? <laughs> man, I don't care about that. Nah. <laughs> like, I'm mad, too, we lost. Like, right. right. But you expect me to – be, say sorry like no like i get it like hey no nah. <laughs> that was funny that was hey, funny. Hey, what, what's the uh have you had do you have people in your dms you know when you do lose talking about you cost them money stuff like that Man, like, what okay. all the time bro that started that started my freshman year uh <laughs> the first story i give is is we played ne- at, at nevada my freshman year and we lost by like we, we were down by nine and um you know i got an offensive rebound on a free throw and laid it up and we lost by seven. And <laughs> I get back, like, immediately to the locker room. I get back, you know, after Coach is, is done, you know, saying the speech and everything. We're all pissed. I go to my DMs, bro. Some dude said, man, you just messed up the money line. Like, you just messed up the spread. I'm like, bro, what? I was like, wait, what? And, uh, now nah, people get upset every, like, especially in college, too. It's just like, oh, you messed up the spread. Or if we lost, it's like, man, you just lost me money. I'm like, bro, why are you betting on college games, bro? Like, it's it's 11 p.m. where you're at like bro go to bed like, just keep your money <laughs> so nah i was uh that was a lesson to learn like bro like there's you know people be betting and stuff like you see the on espn when you know late in the nba game someone lays it up and everybody's like just like mad as hell it's just like yeah Th- nah, that matters to somebody that, that matters, matters to somebody, it does. <laughs> somebody. It does. that matters it to does. somebody man. And, and, and an increasing population of somebody's too I had man, that same night at the draft. I was sitting with one of my friends, um, and he was sitting there, and he took uh, for whatever reason he took Paulo Bancaro to go number one overall, like the night before, and he was like a plus one fifty or something like that. And the line started changing. It was at, it ended up at like minus five thousand, like right before the draft. So this dude's over here losing his mind, like because he just won whatever five hundred dollars off Paulo going. I was like. I didn't even know you could bet on the draft. He over here talking, yeah. yeah, I got Ty Ty Washington going before 22nd. I was like, nigga, what? Like, yeah, what? I, I, why? I, even, I, I should have called you before because I would have had some insider trading. I could have got paid out there. <laughs> <Bro, laughs> see what your I line had, was. I had no inside, bro. No inside <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody did. They said Paolo didn't, or he said he didn't even know until right before the draft that he was going number one. Which is Man, kind of I, feel like, I feel like that storyline was like a few days prior. It was just like, oh. Paolo might go number one. It was like it was just like one article, and then after that, it just started snowballing. I feel like, um, really, I feel like you know, all three of them could have gone number one without a doubt. Um, it's just, I think it was just based off of team need. I would say, um, but Paolo is a great talent. Chet is a great talent. Played against him twice a year, every year in high school, and then uh, and then Jabari as well. Like I mean, there's just such great talent. So. Um, I mean, congratulations to all of them because they they deserve it for sure. 
Hey, all right. So outside of yourself, give me give me two sleepers that got drafted or two people that you know people aren't really talking about that you think are gonna do really well this this during this rookie year. To be honest, Kendall Brown. Uh Kendall Brown, I you know, he got drafted by the Pacers, uh, you know, mid second round, late second round. I feel like, you know, he's a sleeper just because of his his potentials through the roof. Uh, and his willingness to, to get better is, is there. Uh, freak athlete. Um, doesn't even make sense sometimes, like, how high he jumps. Um, and, you know, his motor's there and everything. I think I think he's definitely a sleeper. You know, another Minnesota kid. Um, I mean, the sleeper who was a lottery now is Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. So, like, he was a sleeper. I played against him my sophomore year, and I was like, bro, like, he, just, he was just coming off injury, but I was like, yeah, he – you know he can really play, and then he proved it in the combine, and now again he's a lottery pick. So, um, not nah, for real. He he got a lot of potential, and and he can really hoop. Yeah, Kendall, I like Jalen Williams. Jalen yeah. Williams is tough for sure. For sure. Kendall, for sure. Kendall Brown, a freak athlete from Minnesota, and so on. But then yep. it's like to your point, you wouldn't even think he's from Minnesota for real. Like <laughs> people, nah, people ain't nah, gonna know he's Minnesota. Like. He he like he like Texas, Alabama nah, athletic, facts. like yeah, <laughs> Florida, yeah. something like that. That's crazy. Rabbit, rabbit That's chasing crazy. motherfucker, huh? Like yeah, right. <laughs> Over fences and all that. Like, yo, y'all y'all too. Are y'all too cool? Y'all too friends? You and Kendall? Yeah, yeah. So y'all too like went kind of like kind of ships in the night like you kind of went this way and he he slipped a little bit so do y'all talk about that are y'all able to support each other um through this process at all yeah i would say so uh i mean i haven't really reached out to him about that um but i know you know he knows that you know my line's always open uh you know for that conversation and try to give him as much advice as possible um you know just because you know i'm a little bit older than him and i've been you know been through college and been through the struggles a little bit again this situation is a little bit different from my experience but i'm just gonna i could try to you know help him as best as possible so you know going through adversity going through being undervalued um you know all that stuff so you know again he knows that you know my line is always open for that and you know we'll definitely continue these conversations at summer league and and you know continue to you know see each other periodically so uh yeah he for sure knows Nah, he gonna make a roster he, he gonna yeah. he gonna make the roster he's he, he's good man he, he's got upside you know and i think that you know that type of athleticism and motor like you can't you can't find that every year and size yeah. you know what i mean yeah. so yeah. for sure I mean, he just if he he just make, gotta make shots. He makes shots, then it's you know it's a it's a whole it's a whole other ball game. But I think you know I just think it's important, at least from my experience as a as a professional. I think a lot of times guys don't talk through this process enough. Like you're kind of like, oh, I got to do it on my own, and it's like use your resources, man. Like especially yourself, you know, you got. Hope it will see if Tyus goes back to Memphis. But <clears throat> I mean, you have guys like Tyus and Chet and and Kendall. So I think it's a the dope thing about the game now with social media and easy access to everybody is being able to draw on experience, everybody's different experiences. Like you can draw from Chet, Chet can draw from you, you can draw from Kendall, so on and so forth. And like, I think it's important to, to really connect on those type of things. For sure. I think that's something that's important and really key to like being a Minnesota Hooper. Like, you know where everybody is. I mean, yeah. I, I think, JT, your your generation is a little bit too too far away from mine. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, going up through high school where, you know, starting out, you know, the even Tyus. I mean, Tyus is like my big bro. You know, Trey Jones, Daniel Oturu, uh, you know, McKinley Wright, Theo John, Brad Davison, like Nate Reavers, like Tyler Wall, all those guys. Like, we always know where they are. We always check in on, you know, how they're doing, especially during the season. Or at least that's what I do. Um, yeah. You know, again, just just you know, congratulate them when they you know achieve something well, and and just tell them we we all know that we're all being supported by the same people. So uh, I think that's something that's important, and it's something that'll take, especially the hoop game, especially in Minnesota so far, because there's only you know so many of us. You know what I'm saying? So we're always you know underappreciated because we're from from the north. Um, you know, just not really a hoop state. It's a hockey state. That's what people think. Um, but it's slowly turning into a hoop state for sure. You see, you know, back to back top five picks, um, many, many, you know, I think nine, nine Minnesotans drafted in the last three years or something like that. So, um, it's definitely, it's definitely growing and it's something that's becoming a priority in the state. 
you know, I think, uh, you know, and even, I mean, this is kind of leading into our whole pro culture section, but I think that um, being a younger player, I think sometimes too, it's having those veterans around, but also knowing what to ask, you know what I'm saying? And that's something that like, I would find out like kind of just in the middle of my career, you know, as I was moving along and like, like you said, like, you know, Tyus is like a big brother and, you know, Jordan Taylor is like a drunk uncle. Like, you know what I mean? You got to like really like lean on these people, but like ask like the right questions. So if you got, if you look at your role or whatever. Yo, hold you, on, hold on. <laughs> that was mad disrespectful. Like, what? That came out of nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A drunk uncle. You know, I would be bad, but low key, that's accurate. So I'll like you continue. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Nah, but I'm saying like, so, you know, if you see like different parts of your game, like I remember when um, I remember uh, I was playing with Preston Knowles and Jordan, I don't know if you remember Preston, we played at Louisville, but he was like the, he was like the best defender I've ever seen. Like, and I remember I was just asking him like different questions about like, you know, what he does and when does he know when to reach? Cause I've seen him rip everybody, you know what I mean? And I felt like, you know, just first of all, being humble enough to just ask, you know, something from up here, but then know what you're asking for or talking to somebody about that's like a great cutter. Like, you know, what are you looking for in regards to when you're cutting and things like that? Because, I mean, we're all thinking the game and we all have different things that we that we have as strengths. So, uh, but I think the important thing, especially being a young player, is to, you know, to know what you're looking for or where you, what your role or what you need to improve on and then, you know, going to the right person, um, you know, for that, for that advice. Yeah, for sure. It's super important. I mean, I think the biggest thing that in life that you can do is have self-awareness. Um, it's something that is very hard to do as well because you're consistently kind of mitigating your successes, I would say, or lessening it, you know, just because, you know, you can celebrate in the moment, but also you can't just get stuck in your ways. Uh, I think that's something that's very important as an athlete is that, no matter if you did well in a game, you still have to look back and say, oh, I could have fixed this. I could have done this differently. Uh, I think that's something that I developed, especially through college. Uh, you know, have, again, having the right people around me, um, you know, f fueling me with, you know, motivation to get better, um, you know, consistently celebrating my, my victories as well. Uh, I think that's something that's very important. And then again, you know, to the, to the pros, asking the right questions, I mean, I feel like just being a student of the game is something that is very important. Understanding film, you know, understanding, asking the right questions in film, understanding, you know, being around coaches is something that's very important as well. Just talking X's and O's and everything, just kind of spitballing ideas. Um, that curiosity will take you a long way, I would say. Mm -hmm. Curiosity and self-awareness is something that's very important to be a professional because if someone tells you, hey, you're not doing this, you know, you're not going hard enough and you're telling yourself that you're going hard enough, like most likely you're not going hard enough. So, uh, you know, don't, don't fight yourself from getting better. You know what I mean? Just cause it's uncomfortable. So I think that's something that I definitely learned just over this process is like self-awareness is so key and understanding that you can get better no matter how good you are. You can always strive to get better. Yep. Yep. And that's, that, that's dope. Cause it's, uh, it's definitely difficult because you have to like like good said you gotta set your set your ego aside for that and you know that's not always easy when when you a first round draft pick in the league you know what I'm saying so but um you know I, real quick I think you again just want to keep giving your flowers because back to Minnesota basketball just real quick because we're gonna give it all the love it deserves today you know I sure. think that you <laughs> you to me you the essence of of Minnesota because of Minnesota basketball because it's been good for a while but you know I think now with like Chet and Paige and Tyus and Trey being like the the big, big names, people are like, that's really what put it on the map. But I think, you know, guys like yourself who have flown under the radar and become first round picks are really, you know, kind of what Minnesota basketball has been all about. Like you go look up and you go make a hundred million <clears throat> and, you know, you're going to remind me of like a John Lure type. So um, just to be able to, to have the, the fortitude or the, the, um, the awareness to kind of not let that stuff get to you and just keep getting better is, is super dope. Um, with that being said, if you could, hypothetically, knowing your game right now, let's say you're an NBA All-Star tomorrow, what four players would you put on the court with you that would best complement your game? So wow. you the man, you the go-to guy, you got four, two, or whatever, first, second option, and you got four of the guys. Who are, who are they? And that's tough. 
So since I'm the guy, I'm gonna have to get the ball most of the time, right? Usage yep. rate gonna be crazy. Um, that's tough. I'm gonna need shooters for sure. That's that's really tough. I mean, I'm gonna get. I mean, like like a Clay Thompson would be dope for sure. Just a knockdown shooter. I need a great point guard. Let me get Tyus. Tyus is is a great great point guard to have. It's always solid. Um, and then I need some, I need a big. I feel like me and Jokic could could do something together. I would say just within the the pinch action and and short, you know short corner and all that stuff. So I think that facilitation wise, I feel like I can play off the ball with him. So I got Clay, Tyus, Jokic, myself. And we need some defense. So I was about to say y'all giving up yeah. about 175. I'm gonna get 180, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a big wing. I'm gonna get another big wing. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Kawhi. I'm gonna get Kawhi for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. So he gonna, you know what I'm saying, take the take the number one and then Clay gonna take number two or whatever. And then we can switch everything. One through four, we can switch. Okay. I like that. Yeah. I so, like that. Sure. Who's who on your roster? Goods, who you got? Oh, if I was a man, I need I need a point guard that, that just wanna pass. He, he don't shoot. I need like a rondo. <laughs> like a like a old point guard. I'm talking about kick it up ahead. You ain't gotta cross half court. Oh, Cause I'm gosh. shooting all the balls. I'm shooting all the balls, right? Yep. I'm shooting all the balls. <laughs> I'm putting uh at the three, I'm probably gonna find a four man that can't run pick and roll, because I need all the usage at the pick and roll. Um <laughs> So I'm gonna put a four at the three. Uh, then four man. I'm getting uh, I'm getting David Roddy because he could pass and he's a big screen. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Good good yep. wide shoulders. Yep. I'm getting David Roddy. Oh, nice man. little hybrid stop, forward. Oh, stop talking about this man body like this. Hey, <laughs> nah, I'm saying hey, I need somebody to come set screen. I need somebody to come set some screens. And then hey, uh, <laughs> and then I'm gonna go get a. I'm gonna go get a shot blocker. I need like a. I need like a. Um, actually, I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna go with Bam. I'm gonna go with Bam at the five. You know what I mean? He can block shots. He rebounds. He can start the break. Cause I'm. I'm out. I'm not playing no defense. I'm out. Yeah, I kick the ball up, shooting the rock. <laughs> And then uh, we're gonna lose every game, but you know uh, I'm gonna be the, <laughs> you gonna lose every game, but uh, you know I'm gonna be the star. I'm gonna be in the streets, and uh, that's gonna be it. I'm gonna be at the loop with Jordan Taylor. You know what I mean? Uh, I, was about to, I, was about to, I was about to say you might be the first superstar ever to get benched the way you talking talk about. I'm gonna shoot all the ball. Like have to sit you down. Like it just just take the salary cap hit and cut you. Like talking like that. Like, God, leave. Hey man, no, I, pro I probably would. Uh, I need, I need a shooter. I probably need, uh, I need a clay type too. I probably need a clay type. I need a wing bucket. I probably, I'm trying to think who's a. I probably need like a D book clay. Uh, actually, you know what? I'll take D book and I'll take Mikael Bridges. I'm gonna just take the Suns to be honest with you, <laughs> and probably get a little better four man. Like I need a, a little better four man. No, no disrespect. Oh, Jay Crowder could play and all that, but you know, yeah, Roddy. I'm gonna get Roddy. You know what I'm saying? So that's who I'm rocking with, trying to be CP Junior. Uh, but moving forward, yo, we uh, now you are officially a Memphis Grizzly, which means you are officially an NBA player. And I think a lot of people at this point know the NBA players like to to frequent Los Angeles, California. I'm still we need to get them up in Minneapolis for these programs, but we'll talk about that later. So we need to know is LA the best off season city? in the states they got things like last night bt awards concerts uh obviously the weather open runs the drew league and some decent hoopers so is that is that the best nba is that the best off-season city uh from experience i have no idea i mean what? i train i train in phoenix so i think phoenix is an up-and-coming spot for sure i think after covid everybody started flocking there um it's definitely up there i would say with the drew league you know, training out there, great location. Um, 
I mean, Miami would be solid as well. I know there's a lot of trainers down there. Um, but there's pretty much trainers everywhere. But I say, again, LA is huge. So I would say it's, it's up there for sure. I have no idea, but um, probably, you know, next year, next season or whatever in the future, I'll probably experience it one day. But, um, yeah, it's probably up there for sure. Man, I feel like uh, I feel like you got like cities like Miami and New York, and I feel like a lot of people or a lot of players they pass through there in the off season, but I feel like more people spend more time in LA than any other city, and this is just my estimation. But and I think a lot of that does have to do with um, just the amount of things that are going on. Like you know, when you start talking about even just appearances or you know whatever you may have to do, like off the court, you know, business wise and things of that nature. I mean, Hollywood's out there. There's just so many opportunities and 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 people and people to meet and and things of that nature that uh, I feel like. L.A. probably has to be outside of even just hoop, you know what I'm saying? Like, obviously, the hoop, there's open runs, there's gyms, trainers, and players, you know, being around. But I, I think it's I think it's L.A. for um, f- from my estimation because, you know, it just seems like guys are there a lot more frequently um, in large number than, uh, than other places that are more like transit cities during the summer. Yeah, LA, LA probably the best. I don't know. I think I kind of agree. Phoenix though, just Phoenix is kind of like uh, I don't know. I don't want to say a baby LA, but I feel like it's like a happy medium for everybody. Like LA, yeah. I feel like if you're gonna be in LA, obviously you're gonna spend some. You're gonna spend some bread. I feel like it's a little more high profile. Um, whereas like Scottsdale, Phoenix, you can, you know, what I'm saying us overseas guys can even go to Scottsdale, Phoenix, and live like live for at least for a weekend or so. Live like we Brian for for about uh, thirty minutes an hour. Maybe something like that. You know what I'm uh, yeah, Phoenix. <laughs> yeah, Phoenix is solid. Table. Phoenix is huge too. It's Phoenix is huge. I mean, it was my first time. Like, I mean, staying there. I stayed there for like two months. Uh, it's hot for sure. Oh my goodness. Um, crazy. But yeah, yeah the, the heat's crazy. But I mean, like, just the hoop scene. Like, there's just a ton of NBA guys. There's a ton of, you know, young high school talent there. Like, there's definitely just certain spots where, like, two spots they go. Um, but it's definitely, it's definitely up and coming for sure. And then even, you know, my trainer, Von Compton was just explaining, cause he's from there. So he was just explaining like, you know, after COVID, everybody just started coming down and, you know, started working out. And now it's like really solidified with a ton of NBA talent coming down there. So it's definitely a good spot. Yep. No question. No question. You got a uh, paycheck rain check. Yeah, paycheck, rain check. Somebody's paycheck is taking a rain check. And today is Jalen Brunson. As we are approaching free agency, my man is about to get the bag. So the question is, where is the best fit for his game right now? Is it with, obviously, Dallas is going to throw something at him. There's been talks about the Knicks, um, Detroit. Um, There's a lot of possibilities, but... Let's just say everybody has roster space. Everybody has an open, an open spot for a guard. Where do you, where, where do you think is the best fit for for Jalen Brunson in his game? I feel like I feel like he's good where he's at. I think that. I mean, he did so well in the playoffs and and definitely helped himself. Um, but I think he can be that solidified number two for Luca. Um, you know, Spencer Dinwiddie's, you know, starting to, you know, hoop as well. Um, he did well in the series. Um, but I think he's definitely for sure the solidified number two right now. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, he can develop on and then, you know, the Mavs can do really well with. So I'd say, I'd say he's good where he's at. I, I would, I would agree with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would agree with you. I think I've been screaming from the mountaintops that he's a solid, he could be a solidified number two. I think he's got some of that, like, he doesn't play like Chris Middleton, but he's got some of that Chris Middleton and Giannis feel. Those two do him when you add other pieces around him, like a Christian Wood, like a Spencer Dinwiddie, and Jalen Brunson is a number two, then I think he's a solidified number two. Um, obviously, you know, without those guys, maybe not, who knows, but that's neither here nor there. However, I think he needs to come up here to Minnesota. I think he'd be a great fit for the Timberwolves running the point guard spot. Um, I think, you know, he probably, I don't want to say he would regress. I think he'd become more, play a little bit more how he played at Villanova, maybe a little bit more pass first. 
um, making shots, getting the ball to guys like Carl Towns and Anthony Edwards, but then also being able to be tough defensively, get in the lane and do all that, which I think, you know, I, I don't think Minnesota has had at that spot. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, in a long time. So maybe in the close, you know, they had Tyus, obviously they let him go. Tyus was young, but, you know, I think Minnesota, just watching them play this year, I truly believe that Tyus was the difference in that series, uh, just his ability to calm Memphis down. Both of those teams were frantic and talking and doing all that. And I thought, you know, when Tyus was in the game, the, his plus minus in that series had to be crazy. I don't know what it was, but um, I, I truly thought that was the difference that Minnesota didn't have that type of that type of presence um, or leadership with out of a ball handler to, to get out of the first round. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good call. I think Minnesota would be good because I think, especially with a guard like that, man, having kind of like with Luca, having a bigger guard by your side that kind of takes up that lengthy defender because not not everybody has like you know s multiple super long defenders like that, you know. So I think that um, having you know having somebody else that can score the ball along with you, you know, that that probably is taller and things like that. I think it does. Uh, open things up for you and defenses can't throw you know a bunch of different defenders at you you know what i'm saying especially like with minnesota you know they wouldn't be primarily focused on him scoring the ball as they would you know with a ae over there so i think um yeah no i think that would be a fit but I've, I've been saying this whole this whole time since the season ended i was like man if he stays man i think I think they could be really good, and I think it's a great it's a great situation for him, man. You know, mm -hmm. I think sometimes, you know, obviously, you got to get your bread, you know what I mean, or wherever you feel most comfortable. But you know, when something's working, man, sometimes it's just better to kind of you know ride it out until things switch up, you know, from from my side. My my biggest my biggest fear for him is going somewhere like New York, where he obviously he's been linked to and all that, and his dad is there, and it's like it's great. But it's like New York has so much uncertainty right now. And to your point, it's like, does he got to go to New York and get 20, 25 a night in New York? Like, that's not an easy thing to do when you don't have another guard who's going to take up the best defender and do all that. Like, it's so, you know, obviously, like you say, get your bread. But that that is a, a fear of mine, like I hope. I think a lot of times players need to – the grass ain't always greener. Is it is it worth taking, you know, 25 million a year, whatever it is, over, you know, 20? and being in a better situation? That's a tough one. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. I mean, for uh, me, for me, just with my experience, I would say just being in the right situation, I mean, just is, is always better, I would say. Um, you know, again, millions of dollars weren't thrown into my decision of going to Colorado State, but uh, I can bring that back in and understand, like, man, I passed up on Minnesota and Northwestern to go to, you know, a 12-20 and 20 team, uh, you know, a team who just fired their head coach, like, um, and and flipped that program around. And now, you know, we were the highest seed, you know, my third year, highest seed in NCAA um, for our school. And then, you know, just had a successful season. So, like, flipping that culture around and trusting it because it was a good organization and a good program, uh, great coaching staff, great developmental staff. Like, trusting that was, was definitely treated me better than, you know, going to a bigger school with more money or, you know, you know Big Ten school or high major school. So that's what I would bring it to. Uh, for me personally, <laughs> I would trust the, the, the good – and, you know, I would trust the people who are invested in you and want to develop you and see the good vision, a good vision for you. Yeah, I feel like you know, that's a great point because I feel like the Knicks, man, I, I think that things are just so shaky over there. And, uh, you know, I remember when I was when I was playing overseas, we used to always say, like, the, the moment you get traded to the Knicks or the Sixers, you one step away from being over here with us. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I felt like – Every time they would draft somebody to the – or they would trade somebody to the Sixers, oh, he's coming over. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's coming over. You know, and I think that, you know, certain programs, man, they're just, uh, they're just a little shaky with uh, – and I don't know if it's management. I don't know if it's coaching staff. But, you know, and obviously I'm talking over the span of like, you know, 10 years. You know, not right now specifically. But, uh, yeah, I, I would just hate to see a talent like that just go into a bad situation. And then things just kind of, you know, fall apart. Yeah, yeah. I mean, con continuity, at this level, to me, continuity is, is so important. And, you know, I think James Jones preaches that a lot in Phoenix. So, again, why leave a good thing? You just went to the conference finals. Obviously, 
Listen, I'm, yeah, if you're talking about, you know, millions of dollars, that <laughs> we all know money talks, right? But, yeah, con continuity is, is probably the most important thing. What y'all think, Roddy, you've heard what you think real quick. Um, how does, you know, a lot of these superstars now, they're switching teams constantly every year, and they're really holding a lot of these teams. I don't want to say holding them hostage because it's within their right to do so. But, you know, how do y'all think that affects – the greater landscape uh, of players, like for free agency, for example, Kyrie making this decision to do whatever he's going to do is going to have a huge effect on free agency because it's going to, you know, maybe force a domino effect with KD. So how do y'all think, um, do you think the owners are going to react and kind of tighten up to these type of situations to try and limit this stuff, take some of that power back? Man, to be honest, I ain't got no clue. Um, mm -hmm. I know, I know it's a business, um, and you got to do what's best for you. Uh, I know it's something that sometimes I got to learn as well, you know, taking all the relationships that you built, you know, within the organization or whatever. And, you know, you spent seven, eight years with a program and, you know, it's not really going anywhere. It's like, do I stay and, and, you know, do what's comfortable or trust myself and go to another, you know, opportunity that might be even better or might be worse. You know, you never know. So, um, I think. It's something that's been consistent even when I was growing up. A free agency is just becoming a, a, a frequent thing of, you know, guys switching teams, finding better opportunities, trying to, you know, win a championship. I think that's the biggest goal with everyone in free agency is, is to get, figure out some place and some team that, you know, you're going to win a ring with. So, um, yeah, I have no idea what, what's going to happen, but, um, you know, I think that, you know, both sides are trying to do something to either tighten it up or, you know, be be more free within free agency. So um, I still got to understand it. I don't know that much knowledge about it, but, uh, you know, I think it's something that's been frequent and something that's normal right now with, with superstars. It, yeah. Real quick, my bad. Real quick, is it is it as exciting for you to learn the business side of the game yet right now? Because I know for, yeah. for me, yeah. For me, I didn't really get that till I was like 28, 29. So is that something yeah. like you think about coming in or is it just basketball? I mean, it's basketball as well as the business as well. Just learning so many, so many things. I mean, just from the basic stuff of like, all right, well, I got to pay taxes now. I got to learn about this. I got to learn about that. Um, you know, free agency wise, again, just, just learning so much about, you know, what my contract entails, what clauses are in the contract like certain things like that i'm always interested in that because again it's it's my career um and it's it's you know something that's very important to me so i got to learn everything about it so um yeah i'm definitely excited and i think i have the right you know role models and, and people around me to teach me the right way and um so i can you know make my own decisions because i know what's going on rather than just relying on someone else to tell me like hey what's you know, what's the news, what, what's going on. So I'm, I'm going right. to be in those conversations. So I'm excited for that. That's dope. That's, uh, you got you got something on, uh, on Kyrie? Yeah, no, nah, I was just going to say, um, <clears throat> I was just going to say too, like I think that uh, forcing trades, man, I think it's obviously the owners are going to try to maintain some type of control because obviously you want to protect, you know, your product that you have out there. But I, I think for the league in general, I think it's a good thing. You know, it's during the summer, there's not a lot going on basketball wise. I mean, this creates a story, creates parody. You know what I mean? I mean, nobody wants to see these guys with the same team for seven years anymore. Like it's cool when you got a few guys, but it's interesting when we don't know where Kevin Durant is going next. Like, you know what I mean? People are really, you know, sitting at the edge of their seat. And I think that, you know, given all that attention, it, it, it brings popularity to the league, you know, which ends up, you know, creating more money and so on and so forth. It's a snowball effect. So uh, I actually think it's I think it's good. And I think players will always have a certain level of power um, that I don't think owners will be able to take away because they're also benefiting off of it as well. Yeah, no, no, that's true. That's, I mean, that's a good point. Like, it is the NBA is a soap opera at this point. Like, it's really a TV show. Like, <laughs> like to be honest mm -hmm. with you, but that's how I guess why I asked Roddy. I asked, why I asked you that question because it's like, it's it's got it's difficult because obviously Brian always says, "What's he say? Keep the main thing the main thing." That's like one, uh, and I think he's dead right. 
but I think it's also really hard to balance, you know, nowadays for y'all to, that uh, understanding what's going on in the landscape, but also understanding that you got to produce first. So it's yeah. It, what, what, what you want to say, man? Because you look. Like yo, we got to fact check your quotes. Like you, you always come on here like, yo, Brian always says this or so and so. We got to fact check these quotes. Why hey, next man. week gonna be like, yo, David Roddy always says uh, whatever is whatever. Like, right. I, don't, I don't know, bro. I don't hey, know. If Brian ever said that. I ain't never heard him say that. But no, all see, right, we gonna roll with it. The crazy, the crazy thing I was gonna say is his thing is more than an athlete. Like that's what he's know, right? But what he says to me that always stands out is keep the main thing the main thing. Go ahead, cool. Oh, what he says to you per- personally? That's what he says no, to you personally? No, he says, well, you know, when, when, when we holler at each other, but you know what I'm saying? He ain't really fucking with me right now. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I took one of his joints or something like that. No, we got to edit that part out. <laughs> yeah, we definitely got to edit that part out. <laughs> but no, nah, but nah, yeah, he, he definitely says it. Go check his last post. Cool says it right under the, uh, the post he had with um, – uh, who he just worked out with, Brickley in New York. Man, just pay attention. You watching too much basketball, uh, yeah, you're not I'm, keeping up with the soap opera part. Uh, I like yeah, the soap opera. That. Fuck them games. <laughs> I'm trying to watch the Kings play in December. Man, fuck that. I'm trying to see what the storyline is. But look, man, Roddy, we pre- that's all we got for you, man. We appreciate you coming on again. And again, congratulations to you. Um, enjoy this time in your life. Enjoy this process, and and keep enjoying the grind as well, man. And, and we are definitely cheering for you every day. Appreciate it, man. Thank you guys for having me.